Hello, Market Insights Watchers. In Market Roundup, find out what sector investors are moving their money as the strong U.S. economy and sticky inflation narrative plays out. And tech megatrends, Ian recently attended the Emerge America Tech Expo in Miami, Florida. Find out what he learned. So looking forward to that. And in Crypto Corner, the Bitcoin halving is one for the record books. See what's next. And please remember to like and subscribe to this YouTube channel, the Banyan Hill YouTube channel. We love to have you as a sub. So let's get started. Hi there, Ian. How are you? Did you have a good weekend? Yeah, it was uh, pretty uneventful, you know, standard toddler activities weekend, <laughs> birthday parties, swim oh. practice. Yeah. Oh, that's, yeah. it's always fun. Always fun. Something it is until you're on your like 28th birthday party of the year. <laughs> no, she, she has a blast. So I mean, blast. as that's long as she's happy. Happy. fun, yeah. <laughs> as long as she's happy. Mm -hmm. Okay, everyone. So in Market Roundup, I'm actually going to share my screen for today so Ian, you can follow along with me. Okay. The higher for longer rate narrative continues uh, from the Fed. And as a result, over the past two weeks, some investors have moved money out of stocks as a robust U.S. economy and sticky inflation appear to hold fast. After capturing several record highs in the first quarter, uh, the S&P 500 index has retreated more than 5% in April, following signals that the Fed will likely hold interest rates for longer. And according to Bank of America, uh, strategists see that the good economic news is now bad news for stocks. And Ian, I have to say that for several months now, uh, you have been saying that narrative that good economic news is bad news for stocks. So as a better than expected news has been rolling in from U.S. retail sales data as well as jobs numbers, I have one more thing to share with you. Also per Bank of America, <clears throat> $21.1 has rolled out of U.S. equities as investors redeemed their investment from stock funds over the past two weeks uh, through Wednesday, April 17th. A Bank of America said that it is the most redemptions in a fortnight since December 2022. Now, on a bright note, because we, we are a realistic optimist. Uh, though $21.1 billion has flowed out of U.S. stocks in general, tech funds led sectorally by inflows at $500 million over the same period. So money has been flowing into tech, $500 million so far from investors over the same time period. Plus, as we highlighted in last week's Market Insights, a Bloomberg Intelligence notes that though technicals have become, um, quote, more mixed in the short run, Earnings, earnings cues are all positive as the cycle continues to turn up. So I thought that was pretty cool and, and good to note there. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> I have to share this. This week, uh, we have four of the seven, we call them Magnificent Seven, that's what Bloomberg calls them, tech mega caps reporting earnings. We have Tesla, Meta, and Microsoft, as well as Alphabet reporting from April 23rd, through the 25th, uh, Bloomberg's latest markets live poll survey finds that nearly two thirds or 409 respondents to the survey say they expect earnings to quote, give the US equity benchmark a boost. And that's the highest vote of confidence for corporate profits since the poll began uh, actually asking this question back in October 22. Now profits from seven of the biggest uh, growth companies in the S&P 500, Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, NVIDIA, Meta, and Tesla are on course to actually surge 38% in the first quarter. This is a forecast uh, when excluding them. The rest of the benchmark index indices, their, that, that profits, well, they're anticipated to shrink 3.9%. And lastly, right now, well, there are two camps, bulls versus bears. A uh, bull see this latest uh, market pullback is healthy. Bears, not so much. Now, Ian, we are realists with an optimistic slant. It's interesting to see how tech saw inflows of $500 million while the broader uh, stocks saw outflows. What's your mindset? What's your mindset on this? 
Well, in terms of the market, I mean, the rally we've had since the October lows, I think we're up in the S&P 500, something like 23%, mm -hmm. uh, was one of the strongest six-month rallies in the last 30 years. And so it was inevitable that eventually we would have some type of pullback. You know, right now we're down about 5.96%. 5 you know, we broke through a couple technical indicators, the 50-day moving average. We're heading towards, it looks like we're getting close on the 200-day moving average. And, you know, this is pretty typical uh, mm -hmm. for a bull market to have a pullback. Uh, one way that it's always, as a trader, I learned it was always explained is like, you have an escalator situation up and then elevator down. Uh, this is basically what we saw. We had kind of an escalator situation up and then in a week or two with geopolitical tensions, fears that the Fed is not going to uh, cut this year because growth is accelerating. Uh, you you get a a big sell up like we saw. I mean, I think on on Friday we saw Nvidia down ten percent, which you know that's been really a darling of the market. But to put things into perspective, this is the twenty eighth correction in the S and P five hundred of five percent or more that we've had since the March two thousand nine low. Okay, so fourteen years we've had twenty uh, eight times, right? So this is something that happens typically two times a year. We just had a really good streak where the market hasn't pulled back. To me, it just feels like kind of a run of the mole, run of run of the mill <laughs> pullback in a bull market. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing with these sell-offs is that they always feel like it's the end of the world, you know. And you can rewind to the last sell-off that we had in, in October. It felt like the world was ending. Mm -hmm. The world doesn't end, right? People panic and they sell, and it becomes a buying opportunity for other people. Now. From a risk reward perspective, you're better off. Uh, the buys you make now are going to be in a better position than buys you made a couple of weeks ago. Uh, do I think we could go lower? Potentially, could we drop eight, ten percent? That's potential. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the longer term picture of these things, you know we're investing in in growth, secular growth, big, massive, mega trends that you know might not play out in six months or a year, but three years, five years, 10 years down the road are going to be a much bigger part of the market, even they are now, even with tech's dominance. And I'll just say one last thing about tech's earnings this week, just a little prediction and, you know, take it as you will, is that we, we've we had a pullback in tech stocks ahead of earnings. Now, the economy grew three and a half, three and a half percent in the fourth quarter last year. It's probably going to grow about 2.7% in the first quarter this year. Uh, tech is obviously a big part of that growth. Um, and you saw the bank earnings that came in last week they all the banks rallied. Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, uh, Bank of America went up on those earnings. Now it's like these tech companies are priced to have bad earnings, so we could see a rally into it. The main thing this week, though, Amber, for the next month or two, is the PCE index, which is coming in on Friday to give you another reading on inflation because we all know the CPI has been running a little hot and the jobs number has been hotter than expected. So for me, past the tech earnings, Friday is really the uh, the big day for the market to key off that PCE number. Okay, well, we are watching our calendars and watching that number when it comes through. Okay, now speaking of tech and tech megatrends, on Friday, Ian had a chance to attend the Emerge America Expo in Miami, uh, where the shaping of the future of tech is center focus. And I'll just say this, 2024 content themes included AI and quantum computing, FinTech and cybersecurity. So Ian, mm -hmm. please share what you learned and what you saw. Well, you know, they should do more tech conferences or conferences in general in Miami. Okay. I'm a little biased because it's easier for me to get to, but mm -hmm. also, I mean, the weather's always nice. Um, a couple of things. Number one, I think that um, we're probably headed towards a chat GPT moment in robotics mm -hmm. in the next year. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of companies that are making robots. I saw, you know, obviously they have the robot dogs that are pretty prevalent. Um, but one interesting thing was they had a robot painter. Uh, we'll share the video with you where it was like a robotic arm that could actually make paintings. So you load up a photo and the robot would actually make a, a watercolor painting of it. Um, the other thing I'll say is that uh, I, I spent some time with a friend of mine that is a uh, it, it runs an IT department for a, a, a Japanese bank here in the United States. And he was telling me that a lot of these sort of uh, smaller IT companies that will build applications for businesses. Uh, and, and just an example of that, let's say you have some back office processes that uh, you have to go outsource it to have them build an app. 
uh, Microsoft is making it with their new co-pilot and the AI added that you don't need that anymore. Mm. Um, and so it's going to allow businesses to automate themselves a lot faster. And I think this keys in really well with the, uh, the new newsletter idea that we're working on because they're in this market. What this company does that we're writing up for this newsletter, sorry to segue into this a little bit, um, it helps businesses, especially like Fortune 500 companies, basically create new automated apps for themselves. So let's say, you know, your uh, one example is in, in the court system, when everything shut down during COVID, a lot of the courts had to keep running. So they had to switch to Zoom. They had to make things more online because they couldn't do things in person. This company helped specifically the court system in New Jersey, get online quickly to keep the judicial system moving. It's just one example of what it could do. And, and you know, a lot of the people who work in, in the court system are probably not, you know, very uh, technically focused, right? But so they have software that lets you basically just drag and drop to create new apps for your business. Um, and I think that add that with what's going on in AI as well, is that businesses are going to get more automated. I mean, it's going to obviously cause... Uh, to to lose people in the labor force, but they're going to get more profitable, right? So it, it's an advantage to being an investor. Productivity in the economy is going to grow. Uh, and that really is the key to a lot of our problems, right? Mm -hmm. We've talked about this before. Right now, total factor productivity is running about the, the same slow pace that it's been since 2008. But if you look back in times where there was high productivity in the United States, specifically in the 1950s and the mid 90s, that's when the U.S. prospered. And one of the promises of AI, which I believe, um, is that we raise productivity, you raise profits for businesses, and you also allow, you know, it, 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 when you raise profits for businesses and and people are able to keep more money, uh, and and the GDP grows faster because of productivity it helps a lot with the debt situation right now, because obviously, you know, this is kind of the 800 pound girl in the room. What's going on with, with us debt where we're debt to GDP at 125%, the highest we've been since world war two. But I do think that just seeing these businesses on a micro level and talking to people in it about how AI is actually impacting their business to me was my biggest takeaway from it. And also of course the robot dogs. I can't, robot dogs. can't leave them out. <laughs> robot dogs. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you're probably not going to replace Alex with a robot dog anytime soon, but <laughs> you know, there's some pretty cool applications like one robot, for instance, they have like has chat GPT enabled for kids. Mm -hmm. And it, it's like a little, I don't know. It's like a teddy bear, a little robot teddy bear that like can follow your kids around and like act as a tutor. So they have a problem with like the math. They can show them the problem and the robot can actually like give them suggestions to help them like a, a tutor would. So yeah, I mean, it's pretty exciting what's coming down the pipeline when it comes to robotics and the convergence of robotics and AI. Well, I think that is very exciting. And I'm so glad that you mentioned Strategic Fortunes April issue. So mm -hmm. if you're a member of Strategic Fortunes, please be on the lookout for this new pick. Ian has really dug in really well on this particular stock. And if you're not yet a member of Strategic Fortunes, why not? We love to have you. Why aren't you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Please click the strong hands icon right here over my shoulder to sign up, at, you know, for about a hundred bucks a year. I don't know. It depends on the promotion or publisher it's running, but you can become a member and get all these great uh, stock picks as well for your portfolio. Mm -hmm. Potentially great. Hopefully great. Okay, so turning to crypto corner, Bitcoin halving is one for the record books. And from what I've been reading in, uh, Bitcoin miners may shift their focus to AI after the halving. Uh, Ian, what's your post event analysis on this? Did you have a, did you do anything special for the halving? I did not. I, no, I, it, it I just sang this week. I was I'd singing events, so I missed it. Yeah, it just came and went, right? Yeah. Um, I actually saw that. There was somebody who wanted to get. So what happens is uh, the Bitcoin uh, blockchain every 10 minutes produces a new block. Mm -hmm. And uh, th that is basically the block contains all the transactions that happen in that 10 minute time frame. Mm -hmm. And the halving block was very crowded, which means that a lot of people were trying to get into that just to say they were in it. Mm -hmm. And I saw that someone you can actually pay for preference. So if you pay more in mining fees, your transaction will get put in that block. Somebody paid something like $2 million to put a 70 cent transaction in the block. And I don't know if it was some type of marketing spiel or something like that, but I mean, that that that's, you know, it, it's like, it's kind of a milestone. It happens like only once every four years and it, it lasts for about 10 minutes. So, you know, the halving happened, there was no interruption to the chain. 
there was, has been a lot of back and forth ahead of having, you know, we had a big rally where we were at 70,000 and then we sold off primarily on inflation and geopolitical concerns. The thing I'm watching right now is like Bitcoin is really, you know, three, maybe 5% off its all time high. It's hanging around. And there are a lot of people sitting on the sidelines saying, yeah, I'll buy this when it gets to 40,000 or 30,000 or 20,000. And then as it starts moving higher, those people who are sitting on the fence wind up buying it 70,000 or 75,000 because they don't want to miss it. Right. And so to me, it's a very positive technical sign that even though, you know, we have all this say sell the news event with a having just like with the ETF, but it's not going away. Mm -hmm. And I really think we're in a unique moment in time with Bitcoin in particular, that uh, this is the, the change in beliefs of it going from this, you know, when I first started looking at it, it was just like weird cyberpunk, you know, libertarian mm -hmm. cryptocurrency mm -hmm. to now being a real asset class that people want to have some allocation to, to their portfolio. Now, mm -hmm. whether or not this is non-correlated with the market, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Most recently, it has been correlated with the market. In October, it wasn't correlated with the market, it went up when the market was going down. And so... You know, you, you just I just think this is a moment in time where uh, they call it the Bitcoin super cycle, where the price uh, will start moving up. And as we get past 70, 75,000, there is um, uh, this kind of um, a, a process where uh, it's like an exploration process. Like we don't know where the sellers are and the people who are thinking of selling start making a lot of money. So they stop selling. Right. At the same time that people are buying because they want a part of it. And this has happened over and over again in Bitcoin, which is reason why it goes up and further past that your rational mind can think of. Mm. Because, you know, this is like a completely irrational investment, just like gold. Gold is an irrational investment. Like there's no reason for gold to be $2,500 um, an ounce, uh, other than the fact that people believe it should be. Bitcoin a little has a little more utility, uh, but you know it, it, it's one of these new asset classes that is quickly gaining favor, not only in retail investors' allocations, but also institutions. And I think this is just a moment in time where it's probably going to find some equilibrium price in the next year or two. And then it's going to be like gold, where it just sits there for five or 10 years, right? And then Maybe if you have an inflation period, it goes up or people are scared of what's happening in the world, it goes up and then it kind of cools off. If you watch the look at the chart of gold or the long term, it, it, it's sort of like that where it goes up in short spurts and then it goes sideways. I do think Bitcoin will eventually become that asset class. And right now we're heading towards where that equilibrium price is going to be, which is why I think now mm -hmm. is the time to start allocating your portfolio to it before, you know, $100 trillion of, of global wealth starts allocating it to get ahead of that you know timing is everything anyway so that that's basically the having story it's like yeah it came and went and we're still here and mm -hmm. um <laughs> yeah that's it it's i didn't do anything exciting for the happening i watched it happen that was about it that's it okay i think i was distracted honestly by the barrett jackson auto auction <laughs> which was oh in, okay which what'd you buy oh i won't talk about it <laughs> okay <laughs> I watch others buy. It was really amazing. Anywho, everyone, thank you so much for watching. That's it for this week. And if you have a question for us to answer in next week's webinar, please email us at marketinsights at bryantbandonheel.com. We welcome your comments and your questions. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in. See you, Amber. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>